Hi, this is Mo Nawaz, mentor and strategic advisor to the FTSE 100 leaders. In this evening's webinar, we are joined by Ben Gay III. He has been called a living legend in the sales world. After 50 years in professional selling, he has been the number one salesperson in every organization in which he has ever worked. At the age of 25, he was president of what was then the world's largest direct sales network marketing company, better known today as the MLM. Having been personally trained by fellow sales legends like J. Douglas Edward, Dr. Napoleon Hill, yes, the same Napoleon Hill who wrote Think and Grow Rich, Earl Nightingale, the big giant um, uh, company, William Penn Patrick, Zig Ziglar, and many other sales giants. One of the most famous, popular, and powerful sales trainers in the world, Ben now writes and publishes, produces the closers, series of books, audios, videos, newsletter, and teletraining live seminars, a series that is considered to be the foundation of professional selling in today's times. Ben was the founder and is the current executive director of the National Association of Professional Salespeople. Ben and his lovely wife, Gigi, live near Lake Toha in the little northern California town of Placeville, California, where, as we all know, where the gold rush started. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this is what we've been waiting for, the world's number one authority on sales and sales closing, Mr. Ben Gay himself. Right, okay, look... Um, <laughs> If we sort of like start off with them prospecting to get the, the audience warmed up. By the way, guys, there's no point in typing on Facebook because we, we can't see anything on Facebook until after we switch off. So if you got any comments, either stay on there, stay watching. But if you want to type any questions, you'll have to then go to Google Hangouts or on YouTube Hangouts and type your messages. That way we can see them then. But in the meantime, we're going to get started. So, Ben, if you would be kind enough to try and explain to the audience that we got out there, how, what is the best way for them to prospect? Because one of the biggest difficulties I personally find, and I'm not sure whether you experience the same or not, is people not understanding their target audiences. So, therefore, they get the prospect inside of it always wrong. Uh, very good point. I'm not a technical expert, as you know. In fact, if I were able to help you, we would have started late this time. But uh, the first of all, you, you hit on the right point. Who is it I'm trying to reach? And again, I'm repeat. I'm not a, a Google guy. I'm sort of fat and lazy. I've had best-selling books for the past 25, 30 years, or whatever. And so my idea of prospecting is to answer the phone or respond to emails or go to our website. My point being, I operate on word of mouth. I haven't run a paid ad anywhere in 25 years. Uh, if you're in selling, you know about the closer series. Uh, and uh, if you're in selling, you ought to know. This isn't my ego talking. You ought to know my name. Uh, even if you think it's the, the back rub product or a sales trainer. Uh, so that's made me a bit lazy. So do you young people out there who know how to work the internet and, and how to prospect and build your funnels and all, do all that. But you start with knowing who you're trying to reach. Here's a little tip. I hadn't planned to talk about it today, but it, it used to come in book form, like a great big, 10 volume set, uh, but you can get it on the internet now. There's a thing called the Encyclopedia of Associations, and it has every association on the planet in it. And an association is two, when two or more people find each other who have a common interest, they tend to so A, somehow find each other, and B, form an association. So once you decide who you're looking for, you can find clumps of them through, uh, of course, through Google and all, but I'm just giving you one that every time I tell somebody about it, they look surprised, they've never heard of it. The Encyclopedia of Associations. Let me give you a quick example. Uh, there's a thing called, there's an animal called a fainting goat. 
fainting goat is a goat you sneak up behind and startle it and it freezes like a statue and you can then i don't know why you'd want to but you can then topple it over and the legs will stick straight out just like a real statue well in the encyclopedia of associations there's an international fainting goat association a national fainting goat association and maybe an american fainting goat association the, those three i know uh, and probably there's a european fainting goat association my point is if i were after trying to make contact with people who raised and bred fainting goats i know right where to go in two clicks i would have every fainting goat breeder on the planet at my fingertips so and i promise you whatever your interest is your target audience is two or more other people have had the same desire and they have formed an association and they're in that book and they can be reached electronically. But the first thing, the most important thing you said is who's your audience? You know, the, the, when somebody comes into selling, the worst thing you can say to them is, you know, they say, well, who do I call on? Everybody and anybody. Well, there's no place to start. We used to kid when I was training uh, sales staffs face to face. They'd say, well, who should I call on? And one, one example, because of the product we were selling, I said, I want you to call on redheaded, left-handed dentists in Los Angeles. Nobody else. And everybody laughed and so on. But here's what it did. It focused them down to redheaded, left-handed dentists in Los Angeles. When they've worked all those, then you tell them to go for the right-handed, redheaded uh, uh, dentists in Los Angeles, and then call on the rest of them. And then you, you broaden it out. So my point is the more specific, whether you're doing it for yourself or somebody else, the more specific you can be in who your prospect is, uh, is crucial. And the answer to that is not everybody and anybody. Or, you know, I, I'm in sales, for instance, sales and sales training. So it'd be easy for me to say, well, any salesperson, that's my prospect. Well, it's not true. I'm looking for people who are commissioned salespeople because the closers, once again, I'll pump the book, the closers is really designed for hardcore commissioned salespeople. My client does not work for Xerox and is part of a selling team that calls on a big company and talks to their buying team and then they negotiate and bounce back and forth for six months. My guy or gal calls on somebody and if they're gonna get the sale, nine times out of 10, they get it on the first call, whether it's real estate or timeshare or vacuum cleaners or you know, you fill in the blank. Commission salespeople, the people who, if they don't sell today, may not eat tomorrow. That's my market. Okay. So Ben, just um, just to interrupt there, just to thought um, to stop you there. Can you just, for the benefit of the audience, just a little bit of background about yourself, Zig Ziglar, um, Napoleon Hill, if you can just enlighten the people, because this will then obviously get them a bit more intrigued, in my opinion, once they understand how um, Zig Ziglar and Napoleon Hill and the likes of the rest ended up working for you. So if you can just enlighten us with that story, uh, if you don't mind if, uh, if I interrupting you there on that for one moment. That's all right. I love talking about me. I'll give you the history real quick. September 15th, 1965, I answered a little ad in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution under Health Wanted. The first and only and last time I have ever read a Health Wanted want ad. So the fates were with me because it turned out the gentleman who ran the ad only ran it one day. So I, I read it the one time I looked on the day, the only day he read it. I answered the ad, there's a funny story I'll skip over, answered the ad, went to his office, Wednesday, September 15th, 1965 at noon, walked in, there was another gentleman waiting uh, to be interviewed, turned out it was an opportunity meeting. And I, so I, being a polite guy, turned around and said, hi, my name's Ben Gay, and he laughed like a lot of people do. And uh, I let, let him go through the Ben Gay jokes. And then I said, what's your name? And he said, Zig Ziglar. And I said, with a name like Zig Ziglar, you're laughing at me. Well, I had just met Zig Ziglar. He was a cookware salesman out of Columbia, South Carolina. And uh, uh, 
he had been in selling. He was 18 years older than I was, uh, but he'd been in selling, of course, but he'd never hit it big. On that day, we both started to hit it big. We joined a cosmetic MLM cosmetic company called Holiday Magic and uh, entered into friendly rivalry. Also in that meeting, at the conclusion of the meeting, the man who held it gave me an old record called The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale. He said, I think this will help you. And he gave me an old beat up book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill said, I think this will help you. Well, the punchline to that story is they must have helped because a little less than two years later, Dr. Hill, Earl Nightingale, and Zig Ziglar and a whole lot of other people were working for me because I had risen up through the ranks uh, and beaten everybody in a national year-long sales contest where the first prize was a mystery contest, a mystery prize. And that mystery prize, it turned out, was presidency of the company. It was a mystery prize because the owner of the company, William Penn Patrick, later told me if he didn't like who won the contest, the prize would have changed. But it turned out he liked me. Uh, so I worked my way up, and by age 25 or 26, I was president of the company. Uh, unqualified to be president of the company, but nevertheless, I was able to fake it and get through it, and I had a lot of good people on my staff who helped me, and uh, uh, went from there. Well, in that process, uh, I needed people to build the training. The training when I joined was hand somebody a record and hand them a book. Didn't have anything to do with holiday magic. So I needed to start building some training material. So I tracked down Earl Nightingale and put our name on his one of his famous programs called Lead the Field. It said Lead the Field with Holiday Magic. And over time, Lead the Field with each of our other companies that shared the same marketing plan but different products and names. So Earl came to work for me as a gift to me. Uh, on or about my birthday, August 22nd, 1967, William Penn Patrick hired Dr. Hill to be my friend and mentor and sort of my father figure, uh, saying, you need somebody to talk to other than me. I don't want you fearing your job. Every time you ask for advice, you can deal with Dr. Hill. He will never pass on anything you tell him. I won't bore you with that story either, but I tested the system, and Dr. Hill was true to his word, and Bill was true to his word. I told Dr. Hill things that if he'd been talking to Bill Patrick, would have sent Bill Patrick through the roof, uh, and they weren't true. And I had covered myself with a letter that was sealed in his secretary's desk. But I, I just wanted to see if Dr. Hill was going was gonna to be honest with me. We had become the largest MLM direct sales marketing company in the world at the time, bigger than Amway and Shackley combined. And if you were anybody in selling in the world of sales, marketing, MLM, you were drawn to the Holiday Magic family of companies. And there I sat at the head of them through blind luck. I answered an ad one day. How did I pull that off? That might be of interest to you. I walked into a training room one day looking for my manual. We were out in California to get trained to be instructors with the company. This is before I became president. I walked into a room. I saw Bill Patrick and the then president of the company, Fred Pate, their backs to me looking at a video of a beta player it used to come in a cabinet with a fold-up screen and i saw them looking at it they didn't know i was in the room and uh, i could have said something but i didn't and i heard fred say he's good and i heard my voice coming off that out of that beta player and i realized they were looking at a video i'd made that morning and bill patrick said Fred, I'll pay more for the ability to communicate effectively than any other talent. And that kid's got it. I picked up my manual, back quietly out of the room, <laughs> went down to where uh, another friend of mine, Bill Dempsey, were practicing our scripts. And all of a sudden, I was deadly serious. This was no longer a lark based on a shoe shine and a handshake and all. I was deadly serious about becoming an effective communicator. And I did, and I am. And again, that was accidental. Had I not forgotten my manual, I probably wouldn't have known the value they put on that. But anyway, as a result of that came, uh, Jay Douglas Edwards, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, the Larry Wilson Learning Corporation, 
uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If I'd known we were going to go through a list, I'd actually have one in front of me. But uh, just about everybody that was anybody in sales and marketing, direct sales, especially MLM, which was just coming into its own, they were all there. They all worked for me. So it's not like I frankly went out and built a company around them. Uh, they were drawn to me because I happened to be sitting in the catbird seat. However accidental it was, <laughs> I was sitting in the catbird seat. And if you wanted to speak at the big seminars and get the big fees and build an organization, you had to be my friend. <laughs> amazing, amazing story. Amazing story. Now, Ben, can you, um, I'm a great believer in uh, when it comes to selling either face to face or on the telephone to get the other person, the prospect uh, or the buyer to do the heavy lifting up front for you so that when you do turn up face to face or on the phone, you're not really having to sell as much. Can you explain the concept um, to the audience out there? Sure. In the closers part two, uh, part one is the kicks, the blocks, and the selling, the red raw meat of selling, selling the way it really is, not the way we wish it was. Closers part two picks up where one live, leaves off and shows you what sophisticated people really do with that raw information. And the specific answer to your question is on page 257 of the closers part two. It's called sales infiltration. Ah, that was a, that was another question I was going to ask you, but you beat me to it. <laughs> yeah, sales infiltration is the secret to selling. Uh, I, I wish somebody else had written it so I could say it's the best thing ever written about selling without looking egotistical, but I wrote it, and it is the best thing ever written about selling. Uh, I tell people if when you're young, unless your family was was sick, when they gave you puzzles to put together they came in a box and on the cover of the box was a color picture of what the uh, puzzle was supposed to look like when you got done. Sales infiltration in the closers part two, last chapter, is the color picture on the puzzle box of selling. Uh, it shows you exactly what a master closer sales infiltrator is, does, and how to be one. Exactly. Whether it's on the phone, in person, through an email. Uh, a lot of my good friends today, uh, I know everything about them. I know their family, et cetera. We've never met. We met through email or texting or face-to-face -face in a seminar or what have you. But no matter where we met, I use exactly the same techniques and approach as in sales infiltration. Here's a little tip in sales infiltration. Most sales face-to-face -face are made or lost in the first 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, when people look at you, or in the case of email or texting, uh, read what you've written and, and communicated, back to what Bill Patrick said, I'll pay more for the ability to effectively communicate than anything else. When they look at that, or you, and they run it through their little computer-like brain and compare that sentence or your appearance or whatever with every other thing they've ever experienced in their life. And that can come up good or bad, maybe not even your fault, but good or bad. If you're overweight and disheveled, maybe they've had an experience in their life where they don't like overweight, disheveled people. If you look remarkably like somebody they can't stand, you got a problem. Not your fault, but you got a problem. So awareness of your situation is a big part of what you ask about. You have to know where you are. You have to be talking to somebody you should be talking to uh, about something they're interested in, or you can make them interested in, and you have to be totally aware of your surroundings, what's going on, how they're looking at you, how you're looking at them, how they're relating, and the secret of selling, listen. It was said of Nelson Mandela, that he was a dynamic listener. He was also a great speaker, but uh, when you're locked up in prison, not speaking to large groups for 20 or 30 years, whatever it was, speaking may not have been in a strong suit coming out, uh, but he was a dynamic listener. He therefore would have made a great salesperson. Can I leap ahead to something I think fits in right here, Mo? Sure, please. The 
in selling, uh, people come to my seminars and they and they I hear them say, you know, Mr. Gay, I know I'd give anything in the world to know what you know about selling. Well, the good news is I've written it all down. It's in three books. If you're in Timeshare, it's in four books. It's all available. I'll give you an eBay site, it's special pricing, etc. You just go there and do it. But Here's the real secret. There is no secret in selling. 90% of it's just common sense. And here's how you get around that. 85, I made these numbers up, but no one's ever challenged me. And I think they're about right. They're like most statistics. They're made up by somebody for some reason you don't know about. 85% of all the problems in selling go away if you pick to, to either build or represent for somebody else or produce or whatever. 85% if it is a quality or service of, of quality, the best product or service you can provide, the best in the industry, uh, and it's competitively priced, and you spend your day talking to qualified people. Uh, years ago, I had people come to one of my seminars and they sold Yugos. They were a big group of automobile salespeople, but they sold Yugos, the piece of garbage that came out of Yugoslavia years ago, the car. Uh, they said it had rear window defrosters so your hands wouldn't get cold while you were pushing it. <laughs> but I said to them, why in God's name would you be selling Yugos? Do you not have Cadillacs in your town or whatever was, you know, I think this was pre-Lexus or whatever, but don't you have Cadillacs in your town or Chevrolets or Volkswagen, something? Yugos? Why? And they said, well, they were inexpensive, so we thought we could sell them easier. And I said, no, A, they're not inexpensive, they're cheap. There's a big difference between inexpensive and cheap. So I, long story short, encouraged them to leave their dealership. Their dealership hadn't paid to send them there. They came on their own. Leave their dealership and go find a quality product that was competitively priced and spend their days talking to qualified people. That leaves 15%. That part falls under the heading of you become a person of class, quality, and substance <laughs> with the ability to tastefully project that fact that you are a person of taste. And that's probably another 10% of it. And the other 5% is probably product knowledge. If you're selling cars, for instance, I'm told the average car has about 7,500 pieces on it. I don't know if that's true or not. Somebody may have made that up when they told me. But 7,500 pieces on the car. The average customer, like me, is interested in three of them. Where's the steering wheel? Where's the accelerator? Where's the brake? And then probably, if he can't figure it out on his own, he like, no worry, puts the key. And then as I tell people, when I buy a car, they start to raise the hood and show me all the things. I said, I'm not mechanical. I don't care about it. General Motors has been building cars for over 100 years. I'm sure you got that figured out. Show me where to put the key. I assume this is the steering wheel, right? That's the accelerator. That's the brake. And one other piece of information. What is your personal cell phone number when one of those doesn't work? Because I'm going to call you, not your service department. You. You the service department. You're going to get me red carpeted through the dealership. And that's, again, one of the keys when it comes to selling. What's the difference between this product and that product? What's the difference between success and failure? The answer is you. Okay. Excellent. And in my case, me. Right. right. Okay. If we can just rewind back to the heavy lifting and the, the uh, infiltration side of it. Uh, I'm going to cut you off guard on here a little bit and put you on the spot slightly. Now, if we rewind the clock back um, a little bit before we met, um, how did I did I in, infiltrate into your into your network in order before I spoke to you and asked you to come on the webinar? How did I did I do that correctly, or did I not? You did. You did. And here's what you did. We, you and I have never talked about this. Mo and I have never no, discussed no, this. No, absolutely. Uh, and I wasn't ever going to tell him that I caught him at what he did. What he did was he was, we became friends on Facebook, I assume. He must have asked me to be your friend, and I approved it. And then he started watching the things that I posted. And when appropriate, I don't, everything I say isn't brilliant. When appropriate, he would praise it. 
you know, or encourage me, you know, that that's the way to go and so on, which is what I do on Facebook and LinkedIn and so on with my contacts. I infiltrate them and their organization. I praise them. Everybody likes to hear their own name. They like to be complimented. They like to be patted on the back. And it's important. It's semi-sincere. And I say semi, meaning if Mo had said to me after I wrote something stupid, boy, that's really something, then I would have, Mo would have dropped 20 <laughs> points in my category because I know when I'm stupid. <laughs> I don't always know it at the time, but I know it instantly after it gets posted and it's floating around the world. He only praised things that really uh, uh, were pretty good, pretty profound, uh, and at least uplifting. And so I started noticing his name, it's sort of like Ben Gay. It's a reasonably unusual name. And so I paid attention to it. Then I started following him and I noticed the things he put up made sense. And so we were infiltrating each other back and forth. Then when he asked me to be here and maybe a series of these things, I said, sure. Instead of putting him through the no normal qualification process, who are you? How big is your audience? Uh, how long have you been at it? And so on. I just skipped over all that. And if you find my text back to you, Mo, I guarantee it says certainly, you know, or something like that. Yeah, certainly be happy to do it. And now we have a, a, a business relationship on top of that in a, in a category where I'm also sort of funny about who I let into the circle. And he, as soon as he mentioned it, I said, yeah, happy to do it. Let's do it. Uh, so he infiltrated me while I was infiltrating him. Infiltration, when I was writing that chapter on sales infiltration, I didn't know what it was called yet. I just I was trying to figure out what it was that enabled some of us to do so much better in selling than others. Well, we're all pretty much the same, and most of us have within a year to four years of the same education, and I'm on the low end of that. I'm only a high school graduate with three weeks of college, not three years, three weeks of college. So uh, I'm sitting there trying to figure out how to explain it, and this guy comes into my office with a tool belt on. I said, hi, how can I help you? And he said, I'm here to fix your filtration system. And I said, that's it. And he jumped back and he said, what's it? What's it? And I said, that's what I've been waiting for. I got him by the arm, walked him to the door, said, I'm very sorry. Schedule an appointment, come back in a day or two. Shut the door through the thumb bolt behind him and sat down and wrote like it was inspired reading sales infiltration because I hadn't been able to hang a word on what it was I did. And the greatest salesman I ever worked for, most of it worked with, and saw work was James H. Rucker Jr., Jimmy Rucker. Most of you have never heard of him unless you've read one of my books. Uh, but I used to just marvel at Jimmy. He couldn't, he didn't get up and speak. I was sort of the, the front man for the, for the team. Uh, he didn't memorize all the closes. He knew them, but he, you know, he did, that was, I didn't hear him go, oh, uh, will Monday or Tuesday be better for you? I am now doing a choice close. You know, uh, he just chatted with people uh, and he was sort of cute. He had dimples and the girls liked him. But uh, basically, he just chatted with people and slowly but surely it dawned on me we were both Southern gentlemen. When they started trying to teach me hard closes, uh, when I first joined Holiday Magic as a distributor in Atlanta, I revolted. I didn't. Uh, I didn't verbalize it. I didn't put it in words. But what it really was was it was out of my comfort zone. Thanks to Jim Newman, Pace Seminars. He's the one that came up with that term. It was out of my comfort zone because I was raised as a polite, polite Southern gentleman. I do work with a vacuum cleaner company, and they say not for me. They were saying it before I got there. I'm trying to stomp out the attitude, but they say no sales presentation is complete until, the pol until you have the check or the police have been called. Meaning by the time they call the police, you've been asked to leave several times and you're still not leaving. Well, as a Southern gentleman, if you tell me to get out of your house, I get out of your house. So I had to figure out a way to make sure you'd never ask me to get out of your house to blend into your family. 
I'm called Uncle Ben by a lot of the kids. Some of them grown now and some of them are grandkids. By a lot of the kids, my customers, I'm Uncle Ben. I've been a part of their family as long as they can remember because I infiltrated their family to start with. In sales infiltration, we don't have team A, the salesman, and team B. Because if we do, we start off on the wrong foot. Team A, the salesman, is a lying, cheating thief. That's where salespeople enter the normal interview or uh, sales presentation. And on the other side, you have, uh, you know, buyers or liars, and they'll say anything to get out of buying the product and so on. Well, in real life, the salespeople are probably pretty nice folks, and so are the customers. So what we need to do is rather quickly bridge that gap, reduce the tension, and then J. Douglas Edwards taught me years ago, pardon me while I grope for a book, I don't see one here. Oh, here it is. Sales Closing Power, a book I wrote for Doug Edwards after he died, but it's true to him because it's from his seminar notes and uh, my personal notes and working with him. In my opinion, of all the things he said, the most brilliant thing he ever said was when you have a built-in objection, bring it up first and brag about it. If you're selling Rolls Royces, somebody walked onto your dealership, into your showroom floor, what's their built-in objection? Price. So the first thing you would say is, hi, I'm Ben Gay. Uh, welcome to our dealership. Uh, happy to show you around or whatever. But before we get started, let me tell you something. One of the great joys of my business is getting to meet successful people like you. Where I come from, the average person can't spend $350,000 on a car. So to meet somebody like you who can is a real honor. Then you stare at them intently to see if they faint or throw up because they may not have known they were about to spend three hundred and fifty dollars or a half a million dollars or whatever it is nowadays on a car. That's the built-in objection with the roles, the price. Not the payments, it's the price. And so you bring it up first and brag about it. Doug Edwards taught me to do that. And in sales infiltration, it manifests itself with me saying and giving examples, real world examples of me sitting down and saying to the customer, look, we have uh, some hotshot salespeople at back at the office. They know their sales presentations and how to double back on you and triple close you and do all that. I don't operate that way. I'm just a nice guy who offers quality products that are fairly priced and backs them up with not only the company guarantee, my personal guarantee. Would you like to work on what I call a straight, straight relationship? You be straight with me, I'll be straight with you. Fair enough, which is a great close, by the way, write that down, fair enough. And they always say yes. So now you they've just given you permission to ask them virtually anything, anything. And they can ask you anything. They usually won't. But if they do, they deserve an answer because you just agreed to have a straight, straight relationship. Fair enough. And when they agree, I then say, okay, then here's my pledge to you. I will always treat you fairly, squarely, decently by the rules. Fair enough. To that, they usually say yes. And you are now, plus or minus patting the dog, picking up the kid, uh, saying you like cats, whether you do or not. You are now part of the family, not locked in like Uncle Joe, but you're part of the family. And in the next ensuing 60 minutes, an hour, or whatever, you can become as close as some of their relatives in the family. And if you never violate that trust, you're in forever. Okay. Talk to me, Mo. Um, I have a question here from Rod Sloan. He's asking oh, a question here. Um, ben, what's your view on uh, positioning statements or elevator pitches? One, I'm glad. I'm so glad you said that. Uh, drop pitch from your vocabulary. Uh, salespeople, professional salespeople, make sales presentations. They don't do pitches. Just like speakers who are smart don't do gigs. They give presentations also. So get that slang out of your vocabulary. My position on that is you script it. You script almost everything you say. 
Hal Holbrook, the great actor aging now, does Mark Twain. He has nine and a half hours of material memorized in his head. He walks out on stage and always does the first, the first story he tells is, or joke is always the same one. He uses that to take their temperature and what they, how they react to that determines what he does with the second story and the third story and so on for two hours minus a little break in the metal intermission. But it's all scripted. So your elevator uh, introduction or what, however you want to call it is the same after you've written it, memorized it, tested it, etc. Everything you do is scripted. My dad sold Roy Rogers, the old cowboy movie star, now gone, his ranch in Apple Valley. And there's three stories, I won't tell them to you, but three stories that I love about Roy Rogers, Dolly Parton, and Cher, speaking of old uh, performers. Uh, each one of them in different stories that I'm aware of, Roy Rogers in Apple Valley near his museum, Dolly Parton before a concert, and Cher uh, when she was about to do, I think, a television interview, got up, straightened her clothes and said, well, I've got to go be fill in the blank. Roy Rogers said, I've got to go be old Roy now. He loved racing boats. He normally wore a baseball cap and tennis shoes, but no one ever saw him like that. He had on the hat and the guns and everything, and he was old Roy. Cher, I'm sure, looks different uh, in casual garb than she does on stage, but she says, I have to go do Cher now. I have to go be Dolly now, in Dolly Parton's case. So when, when you're meeting someone or selling them or giving your elevator presentation, uh, what you're doing is stepping, so, come, some uh, comes more uh, comfortably to some people than others, but you're stepping into a role. When uh, I don't wear my Ben Gay shirt all the time, but when I realized I was doing this this morning, I became Ben Gay. I went and I combed my hair, had Gigi put on my headset where it didn't mess up my hair too much, put on my Ben Gay shirt, and now I'm Ben Gay. We consider Mr. Gay a product. I talk about Mr. Gay like he's somebody else. We have books, we have CDs, we have this, we this, and we have Mr. Gay. That's not ego. It's a role that I play. I'm actually more shy, uh, less verbose uh, when I'm not being Mr. Gay than I am any other time. So with the elevator presentation or anything else, you script it, you memorize it, you understand you're playing a role, and you say, adjusted for the situation somewhat, you say the same thing every time. The Wall Street Journal has a letter they send out to get you to subscribe. They have many letters they send out, but they sent out the best one they've ever sent out for the first time about 50 years ago. Starts off, you've probably gotten it depending on where you are. 25 years ago on a spring day, two young men graduate from college, blah, 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 blah. Today, one's the CEO of a company. The other one is stuck in middle management at the same company, same age, same education, same everything. Then they imply that the only difference between the two was one read the Wall Street Journal. The other one didn't. Therefore, you should subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. For almost 50 years, that's their control letter. They've been trying to beat it. They send out different letters. They change the wording and so on. Nothing has ever beaten that letter. You need a Wall Street Journal control piece for your elevator presentation, for all of your sales presentations, et cetera. Now, the prospect doesn't always know that you've been to memorization school. They uh, they throw things in They're like a bad actor on stage. You give them a line. They don't say back to you what they're supposed to say. So that screws up a poor actor. Well, in your case, you have scripts ready for when they don't respond as if they're supposed as they're supposed to respond. You have a script for virtually everything, everything. I think that I, I get sometimes self-conscious if somebody asks me a question, I've known them for a while and so on, and I'm thinking, if they asked that before, because I hate to give them verbatim what I told them last time, but I almost have to, I know how to explain things effectively. If I tell you a story about somebody I know, tell, ask me in two years from now, because I've been at this a while, I probably polished that story pretty well, <laughs> ask me two years from now, I'll tell you the same story verbatim. 
And then people who are listening to this will say, but I don't want to be on a script. Back to the elevator question. I don't want to be on a script. Let me give you some news. Anybody who's been in selling more than 30 days is on a script. We tend to say the same things in the same situation over and over again. So the question is, is it a script you designed with malice and forethought, wrote down, practice, memorize, so that you could give it on cue at any time? Or is it a script that you just drifted into out of laziness and slothfulness and listening to the loser at the desk next to you? Because he probably didn't hone his either. So as Earl Nightingale used to tell me, check your references, Ben. <laughs> Always check your references. Be sure who you're listening to. Does that give you a good idea? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. If we can jump to the next um, section, um, okay. price and value, either separately or together. What's your opinion of pricing something high or something that's uh, lowly priced to sell volumes or um, selling quality at a higher price? And also the question of value, perceived value. How do we create perceived value? And how do we demonstrate value uh, in most people, whether it's a product or a service? Well, uh, first of all, uh, you listen. The prospect will tell you what they want to hear and, uh, and uh, how they want to be sold. So you listen, listen, listen. As far as pricing goes, uh, I have no problem selling an inexpensive product. I'd rather sell an expensive one because there's more money to be made. But I won't sell junk. When I said inexpensive, I don't mean cheap. I have no problem with selling an inexpensive product as long as we both know what the deal is. Uh, you know, this is priced this way because of this and so on. So it doesn't make any difference to me. I've sold extremely high priced things. I've helped sell by training and, and riding along on calls, flying along on calls. I've helped sell corporate jets and for millions of dollars. And uh, I worked at Macy's in the housewares department and I sold, worked off the 88 cent gadget counter. No, no item on, on the gadget, hundreds of them. Nothing was priced higher or lower than 88 cents. I sold an 88 cent nutcracker with the same enthusiasm I sold a Gulfstream jet. Because mm -hmm. for 88 cents, you got exactly what you paid for. You knew it was a nutcracker, it's good quality. It's not going to snap off in your hands, et cetera. And you know it's not supposed to be $20 million. Uh, when you get on a Gulfstream, you know that it's not supposed to be 88 cents. <laughs> so it doesn't, make, it, it doesn't make any difference to me whether it's high or low. Now, how does you build value? by listening, finding out what they need. I wish you couldn't change the price. That's one of the problems in the automobile business. The manager and everybody else has the price, the ability to change the price around. And therefore you always feel like you're about to be cheated when you go into an automobile dealership. If it were my automobile dealership, it would have the price right on the window. And that's the price. Take it or leave it. You know, is it ever going to come down? Might if it sits here 30 days, drive by every, every day and take a look at it. But when the price changes, it'll change for everybody at the same time. So uh, what we now need to discuss is, is it, is it worth 10000 40000 whatever the price is? Is it worth 10000 I think it is, or I wouldn't be representing it. I've already done the sales infiltration with you. I'm going to treat you fairly, squarely, decently by the rules. I'm going to be straight, straight with you. Give you a car dealership example. My mother-in-law years ago read somewhere that she could get uh, the best value by skipping the initial depreciation on a brand new car by getting a car at Hertz, the rental people. And they happen to be coming to town to do a big thing at our local fairgrounds, the Hertz thing. And I said, being Ben Gay, I said, let me go with you and uh, I will make sure that they towed the line and we get the very best price. If any of your viewers have been to a Hertz rental sale or whatever, they know where I'm going with this. So I take her in, standing a little tall. I think I even wore one of my Ben Gay shirts. So the person might know 
uh, that he's dealing, he's not dealing with your average run of the mill person. This is Ben Gay, the sales trainer who teaches people how to close. And she went up, and I have to make up numbers because I don't remember what they were, but let's say she went up to a Honda and it was $12,000 several years ago. I said, do you really like this? And she said, well, yeah, it looks good. A friend of mine has one like, I said, fantastic. Stand back. <laughs> and I called the young man, <laughs> called the young man with the clipboard over. And uh, I said, uh, uh, young man, I noticed this car is $12,000. He said, looked around on the windshield and said, yeah. <laughs> it was sort of like he was happy I could read. And uh, he said, yeah, <laughs> you got that right. And I said, well, I noticed there's a slight scratch here on the door or whatever. It was some flaw I noticed. And he said, yeah, that's the reason it's $12,000. And I, so I opened the door and I said, and I noticed in here, I forget what it was, maybe a little stain on the upholstery or something. And I said, and this, because I'm getting ready to set up some real problems for him so I can knock him off that price. <laughs> and he said, yeah, yeah, they took that into consideration. That's $12,000. That's the reason it's $12,000. Well, we went through three or four other things. And while I'm talking to him, this other sales young kid with a clipboard, comes up, slaps a sold sign on the windshield. Somebody on the other side was looking at the same car, didn't have quite as many questions <laughs> as I had, and grabbed the car. <laughs> so I, I said, okay, what else do you have in this price range? <laughs> I said, well, this one over here, and I ran over, ran around the car real quick. I said, she'll take it. Uh, I, I realized this was a different game than I'd been in. They built the value through the name Hertz, through their reputation, you're getting the cream of the crop of their rental fleet. It's been serviced almost every time it's been rented out, at least checked over, serviced every whatever, 5,000 miles, et cetera. We know the car business. We, now it's enterprise, but we know the car business. At that time, they were probably the biggest car buyers in the world. So they know how to price things. They knew everything about it. And I'm Ben Gay, who's never on a commercial lot sold a car in his life. I bought over 500 luxury cars for myself and to give away as prizes, but I'd never sold any. And so I took on Hertz to show them how clever I was. And Hertz brought me into line that quick with a 20 year old kid, <laughs> built the value of the name, built the value of the car, explained there was no negotiating, but they'd be more than happy. For, and I think the kid even said at one point, uh, if if he didn't, somebody else has to me at another point in my life. Maybe we could find something more in your price range. <laughs> and I'm going, I can pay $12,000. Price isn't the issue. It's that scratch. Well, like I told you, it's, that's already figured in the price. So you build the value of whatever the price is to match it. Now, if the value isn't there and someone is asking me, so how do you con people and believe in the value is? The answer is I don't. I won't do it. I treat people fairly. You know, people say forever say to me, I bet you could sell, sell snow to an Eskimo. I said, I probably could, but I won't. I bet you could sell this to so-and-so. Yeah, probably could, but I won't. I've never knowingly sold anything that wasn't worth what we were asking for it or more. And based on the value, I was able to match them up within their head, probably more. Uh, because I, I know what it will do for you. And I've mistakenly sold a couple of things in my life that it turned out wasn't as good as I, I thought it was, but I found out later. And where I could do anything about it, I apologize. And one person's case, although I didn't get the money for the sale, I just got the commission. I paid him back his whole money, all of it, because I wanted him to always trust Ben Gay. I wanted him to go tell his friends. If Ben Gay tells you something, he'll do it. Quick story. Do I drive? A friend of mine called me and he said, I'm, I can't get to a seminar I'm supposed to do in Jackson, Mississippi. Will you do it for me? Yes. Jimmy Rucker, the greatest salesman I ever worked with, and I jump in our brand new Cadillac, drive from Atlanta to Jackson, Mississippi, through a thunderstorm. It was a nightmare, but we got there. Room set up for 500 people. It was a basketball gymnasium. I went downstairs uh, to change into my suit since I was the speaker. A few minutes later, Jimmy came downstairs and I said, are they ready? And he said, yes, he is. And I said, no, is the audience ready? He said, yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> 500 chairs, one prospect sitting in the front row. His name was Nolan Bush. I'll never forget it. 
so I came up and I said, Nolan, uh, after I met him, I said, hi, I'm Ben Gay, Nolan Lewis, blah, blah, blah. I said, Nolan, I only know how to give this presentation by script as if there's a room full of people here. It's not your fault the other 499 didn't show up. <laughs> would you mind if I gave you the full boat? He said, I would love that. So I, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ben Gay. I'm a general distributor with Holly Magic. It's my pleasure to bring you, to welcome you to tonight's special meeting. And for 47 minutes, I went on and we showed the film. Lights came up. Film says, turn to the person who brought you here, ask how you can get started in Holiday Magic. I went over, sat down with him, drew the circles and so on. And, and uh, he decided he wanted to be a, what was called a master distributor, about $2,500. It required a cashier's check, which he didn't have in the middle of the night in Jackson, Mississippi. So I said, get with the person who sent you here. Merle Frazier was his name. And you guys work it out. I think he did, but I don't know. Fast forward 20 years. I'm standing in front of a room uh, about 10 miles from where I'm right now in our training room, teaching a class called Advanced Business Training. It lasts 10 days. And the goal is to teach you how to run the business and so on. But the strict sales goal was you're supposed to come up with $24,625.13. That was the price. So I walk in, introduce myself, talk for about 30 minutes and so on. No, we're not even days close to asking for the money. And a guy raises his hand in the back and I said, yes, sir, how may I help you? And he said, well, I can tell that you don't recognize me because you've looked me straight in the face four or five times this morning, but I recognize you. And he stood up and started walking towards me. I thought, God, I'm about to be served with papers or something. <laughs> <laughs> and he turned to the group and he said, 20 years ago or whatever it was in Jackson, Mississippi on a stormy night, this man sent by a friend without a penny involved that he could make one way or the other, uh, fulfilled his obligation, drove hundreds of miles through the night and gave me a meeting word for word what he was supposed to do as if there were 500 people or 5,000 people in the room. So he said, I don't know really what we're selling here, what you're offering. But I do know this, and he handed me a cashier's check for $24,625.13. I said, I do know that if you tell me it's true, here's the check. And as he started back to his chair, he turned around and said over his shoulder, tell me what I bought. <laughs> now, that's what credibility can do. It took 20 years. I and mean, that's a slow close, I'll admit. It took 20 years. But that's what you get when you treat people right. And one of the other advantages of scripting, Mo, is when you say to me, well, you said so-and-so, I can honestly say, I, I may agree, which in most cases I do if it's close, you know. But if they say, but you told me so-and-so, I said, no, I didn't. Do you remember the conversation? No. Well, how do you know? Because if you had asked me that question, here is verbatim what I would have told you. And then I give them the script because everything in selling is scripted, just not necessarily in the order in that help. Holbrook example where he opens with a short story, a joke engages them. When I go on stage, standard introduction people read and it tells you how wonderful I am and everything. When I go on stage, if he read it right, she, he, she, uh, I get a standing ovation. If it's 10 people or 10,000, I get a standing ovation. As they sit down, I say, okay, let's get this Ben Gay thing out of the way. And they always laugh because they know that's what they're thinking. Does he know there's a product in the grocery store named after him, Ben Gay? And uh, I, I tell the story, one, I don't have to come up with a different joke every time I give a speech. I've been using that one to open speeches for 30 years or more. Uh, but mainly, I'm listening. If they roar, I'm home free. All I, all I have to do now is don't screw up. If they <laughs> uh, get mild applause back, I know I've got to go to work. Now, when I go to work, it just like Hal Holbrook, it just changes the story that I pull out of my jukebox. You remember how jukeboxes <laughs> used to have records in them? You know, the arm, it changes where the arm goes to get the next record that we bring up and put on. But when that record is on, it says exactly what it said the last time it was on. I had a guy 
uh, Ern Westmore, the great ma makeup artist, he, the Westmore family of Hollywood, he and his five brothers were each head of makeup at all of the major studios in Hollywood at one time or other. He dropped dead on stage in New York, having just introduced me. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is, my new good friend, blah, 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 Ben Gay III, and dropped dead like he'd been shot with an elephant gun. I started to run from the room. This I, first time I talked to 5,000 people, I was scared to death anyway, but uh, I, I was committed. The spotlight had already swung over to me. I was coming up the steps. And uh, so I got, did all the things you do. Is there a doctor in the house, blah, blah, blah. But rather quickly, I knew he was dead when he, before he hit the floor. It was just obvious. Uh, it wasn't a fainting spell. And uh, so we went through all that. And then they loaded him on the gurney as they started wheeling him off. There's 5,000 people looking at me. You know, what are you going to do now? And uh, I, I'd had lunch with him that day and a, a, a gift from God descended on me. I said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Ern Westmore had heart troubles. He was eating uh, nitroglycerin tablets like they were M&Ms at lunch <laughs> today. And, uh, so, and I said to him, uh, I hope you live forever, but with this heart thing, you know, if you had to go, how, how do you want to go, Arn, after a great life you've had? And he said, I want to go on stage talking to women about beauty and fashion. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, you just watch Ern fulfill his last wish. Now let's give him one last standing ovation. And they, it was at the Park Sheridan Hotel in New York. They almost tore the room apart, cheering for him. And out the door he went, flap, flap, flap. And then slowly the people all sat down. And I thought, okay, smart boy, what are you going to do now? And then it dawned on me. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ben Gay. I'm a general distributor with Holiday Magic. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's special meeting. And I went right into the 47-minute script, showed the movie, brought the lights up, said, turn to the person who brought you here, ask how you can get started in Holly Magic. And they did. And our closing rate was about three times what we would normally expect from a group like that. What it really was, was everybody in the room who had $2,500 put it up. Excellent. I don't think anybody got out of there. What saved me was scripting and keeping my word and, and so on. Long answer to a short question, but I hope that helped. Okay, we got uh, Mercedes Leal. She wants to know, <clears throat> Ben, um, uh, do you think we still need Mississippi length? Sorry, I'll start that again. Um, ben, uh, this Mercedes Leal um, wants to ask a question. Um, ben, um, do we still need Mississippi length um, copy to sell online or a shorter, sincere description with bullet points? I think she's referring to long copy versus short copy. I'm assuming that's um, what um, Mercedes is asking for. Yeah, I came up in the Joe Carbo school. He ran big full page ads, Lazy Man's Way to Riches. And he sold a book, I think it was $14.99 or something with a lot of text and copy. Joe Sugarman then personally taught that. I was in the seminar with Carbo and Sugarman, but it was Sugarman's seminar. <laughs> excuse me, at his house in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. And uh, he taught the long form. And one of the most successful ads I ever ran was, headline was Greed, G-R-E-E-D. Everybody said, don't do it, don't do it. We sold millions of copies of the closers from that ad. And it was a full text thing. Now, and, and the secret to that was the headlines got to make you want to read the first sentence. First sentence got to make you read the second sentence and pull you through the copy. That's all it is. And in the old days, you could get away with it. And if you've got a really great piece, you still can. However, uh, with apologies to Ms. Uh, Ms. Griffin, my English teacher, senior year in high school, who taught me how to write and speak, uh, I now break the rules of grammar frequently. I break up, one, I write shorter. Two, I try and keep sentence length, not in an email to a friend, but in copy. I try and keep sentence length down to eight or nine words max. Uh, I break the paragraph after three or four lines, usually. If it's a thought you just can't break up, I might go five lines. Because today's reader, and I don't want to say anything uh, detrimental, about the millennials and the people raised on on tablets and screens and so on. They have the attention span of a gnat. 
<laughs> and, and, and you have to get them quickly. Same rules apply. Headlines got to get them to read the first sentence. First sentence got to get them to read the second sentence. But you got to give them hope. If you put, put up a full page of text, they look at it, their eyes cross, and they go on to the next thing. No, uh, you can't get away with that anymore with rare, rare exceptions. So you break it up, you keep it short, you keep it interesting, and you get to the point. And the point is always, what the reader wants to know is, what's in it for me? You know, blah, 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 cute. What's in it for me? That's all I'm interested in. I couldn't care less about you, your corporation, your this, or your that, until you assure me that if I devote some of my precious time to listening to you, I'll be happy because you understand what's in it for me. Uh, Gigi and I, for instance, uh, we act on our behalf. You know, people say, well, shop locally. We do. We shop locally quite a bit. Downtown is one mile from where I'm sitting, Placerville, California. And we shop locally whenever we can. But we shop locally whenever we can when it's to our advantage or at least not to our disadvantage. You say, well, you can't do business with a big box store. I can. Uh, you can't order on Amazon Prime. Oh, I can. <laughs> um, it had a delivery made this morning for something I uh, bought and, on Prime. And it showed up in two days, and the freight was free, and I'm a happy camper. And I, and, but I know in town it would have cost me more, uh, and I just didn't want to do it. So I always act in what's in it for me. Understand your reader, your listener, that's what they're doing, what's in it for me, and get to it quickly. One other thing you didn't ask, Mercedes, but let me share it with you anyway. In copy, on, especially on the internet and so on, uh, but I even do it in printed copy, uh, give them bailout points. In other words, tell them you don't have to read all. One of the I was looking at the closers ad that I was talking about the other day, the a while ago, the greed ad. I was looking at it the other day, and I thought, whoa! Besides the fact it's long, and even I wouldn't read it now. The other big mistake I made, maybe not then, but if I if I did it again today, was I didn't give them bailout points. In other words, da 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 da. da. If that's enough, call 800 blah, 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 or go to www, whatever you want, whatever action you want them to take. Give them that opportunity frequently. I now, instead of all that copy and down at the bottom, it says the closers 800-248-3555-wwbfg3.com, et cetera. Now that those bailout points are all the way through the copy. You, Mr. Customer, you tell me when you've heard enough. And when you've heard enough, feel free to buy. Don't let me hold you back. I'm done with that answer, Mo. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> I thought um, we were having a stare down. <laughs> no, um, Sha Shaquille's asking a question here about networking events. Is it a good idea to... Um, plan long term when you're at networking events rather than people who expect uh, instant results? Uh, both. Uh, people will call me and say, I've been thinking about going to the seminar, should I? I go, yes. But I didn't tell you what the seminar was. Now, you may be talking about one of those things where they gather together to swap business cards, but that in that family of meetings, I always say yes. Because you will do more good in the audience as a member of the audience than you will probably get from what you hear from the stage. Uh, it, you know, if it's a motivational, inspirational thing, let me save you the trip. Get Earl Nightingale's The Strangest Secret and listen to it. Everything that you hear from the stage, including from me, is that message reworked. As someone once said, by the time the Bible was done and Shakespeare died, it had all been said. The rest of us are just moving words around. And I'm guilty of that, I, I admit. It, I have no choice. Everything has been written. Uh, so I go to meetings. For instance, I just accepted an engagement to speak uh, closer to my home than I normally do. I don't like speaking close to home because I don't like to have to dress up when I go outside. If I'm home, I'm home. And I might have on beat up tennis shoes. I don't want local people uh, judging me. But I agree to this because 90% of the people attending it are, are coming uh, from elsewhere. But 
the condition I made was it's uh, my fee is 9,500 for a, up to from an hour to all day, whichever. But my condition was, but I will come early if it's three days, it depends on where they put me. But I'll come probably the night. Let's say they're going to put me on at noon on the second day. I'll be there late in the afternoon, at least on the first day. I might even come and open the doors with the janitor. And I'll be there when they close it at the end of the third day. Not working from the stage, working, networking, getting cards, making friends, etc. The work, and I always tell the person, I probably do more good for you mingling for two or three days, and I will from an hour or two or eight hours from the stage. That's true for them, but more importantly, it's true for me. Uh, I have dear friend. While I'm talking, I'm thinking of a seminar in Portland where I met a guy 21 years ago now. One of my dearest friends on earth would not have met him because it was a big crowd and so on. Had I not stayed for several hours afterwards, mingling with people, shook his hand, instantly liked him, vice versa. We've done lots of business together ever since. So I, I'm one of those old fashioned people. I probably go through, if it's a good seminar a month, Ten or, and we put in the front of every book one of my business cards. Oh, well, this one's signed. Uh, one of my business cards. So between the stick on business cards that go in all the books and the cards I hand out, and when I give a seminar, there's one in every seat. When you come in, there's a Ben Gay card in every seat. I go through 10, 15,000 business cards a day while people are saying, well, that's old school, you know, and nobody looks at business cards anymore. Percentage never did. But I want them to have exactly how to reach and contact me, by the way, whether it's in one of my books or somewhere else, study my business card. It is classic. It says my name, exactly what I do how to reach me by voicemail internationally, nationally, et cetera. It still has a fax number on it. Fax machines right here. It's about to be disconnected. I, all I get is offers from hot chicks from Russia who want me bad. Uh, <laughs> so, and my website and the mailing address and so on. So, and subtlety, if you have your picture on your business card, always make sure your face is facing the text. It draws their eyes to where you're looking. So I go through lots of business cards. I meet lots of people. I listen to them. I stare at them. Uh, here's my goal with everybody I meet. And you'll find it in every book I've ever read about a great person. Somewhere in the book, you will find a variation of this sentence. When I was with him or her, I felt as if I were the only person on earth. When I'm with him or her, I feel as if I was the most important person on earth. That's the, the phrase. And everybody thinks they came up with it individually because of the way that person made them feel. When I meet you in person, uh, I want you to believe, and you are for that period of time, the most important person on earth. My first job with William Penn Patrick. Uh, when I started moving up in the company, I went on a 25 city tour with him. And I said, what am I going to do? He said, you're going to introduce me. Here's exactly what you're going to say. And then after the seminar, after the speech, you're going to stand near me. And when somebody has dominated my time too long, you're going to take me by the arm and say, Mr. Patrick, we have to do this and get me out of that situation because I will never break off contact with the person that I'm talking to. I said, wow, that's pretty neat. Towards the end of one of the, my early meetings with him, uh, I said, uh, Mr. Patrick, we have to go. And he pulled his arm back. He says, not now. I'm talking to so-and-so. So I backed off and stood there another 10 or 15 minutes while people waited and waited and waited to talk to him. Later, when we were going up the elevators, it was Park Sheridan Hotel in New York. We are going up the elevator. He, the elevator door was shut. And he said, I ask you to do one GD thing break up conversations. I said, you pulled your arm back and said, not now. And he, he said, that's what I do. What you do is get me out of the situation. I said, oh, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> 
but everybody to this day, Bill's been dead 40 years, died in a plane crash up at a ranch. Uh, to this day, if I'm talking to somebody about Bill Patrick and they met him, they'll say, I'll never forget him. When I was with him, I felt as if I were the most. And so that's your goal. Uh, to be able to have people say that about you. Bill Clinton had somebody in his office, in the Oval Office one day, and he said he never broke eye contact with me. It was almost unnerving. Then they brought in iced tea, and I thought, well, at least I'll get a break, uh, you know, from the eye contact. Clinton's iced tea glasses were bigger on the bottom than the guests, and when he <laughs> took a drink out of them and lifted up, he said he was looking at me over the ice cubes, <laughs> over the iced tea, out the bottom of the glass. He said it was the damnest experience I've ever had. But I'll tell you this, when I was with Bill Clinton, I felt as if I were the most important person on earth. There's your goal. Excellent, excellent. Right, Ben, tell us a little bit about Napoleon Hill and what you, in your opinion, what sort of a person he was. Was he a wealthy person? Was he? Did he struggle through life, uh, most of his life? Yes, <laughs> to all of your questions, yes. Uh, he was not a wealthy person when I met him, but he'd, he'd been, he'd had his days, and we sort of made him a wealthy person. He was paid $50,000 to be my mentor. Uh, I found out when I was signing a check to him, uh, 50000 <laughs> and this was, you know, today that'd be half a million. So getting me as a coaching, we didn't call it mentoring and coaching then, but getting me as a client, paid friend, hired father, whatever, that alone was a big payday for him. And so he'd had his ups and downs. He'd had his marital problems and all, but I didn't know all that then and don't care. One of the things you have to do is separate yourself from the, from the messenger and the value of the message. Somebody I won't mention by name right now, because it would take away from what I'm trying to tell you, uh, couldn't close a refrigerator door, but from the <laughs> stage, they were the great closer. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, I, but I made the mistake of knowing what was behind the scenes, and that really messed up my thinking for a while. You know, I go, he can't do that. He can't do that. He never did that. Well, I'm listening to it. Well, whether he did or not doesn't change the fact the information was right. So uh, Dr. Hill didn't lecture me on how to have a great family life because he hadn't had one, I suspect, is the reason he didn't. For me, he answered questions. I had a great big conference table. It was my desk, but before I got there, it had been the conference room. So I just had a fancy chair in the middle on one side and 10 chairs, and then you could draw up some more and turn it into 14 or something, I think, around the outside. So it was rather impressive. When Dr. Hill was in town, his desk was the end of my conference table. He would come in, sit down, and go to work, and he, would, he wouldn't say a word unless I asked him something. <laughs> Or if I got off the phone and was shaking my head, he said, you want to talk? <laughs> One of the most common things you say to me is calm yourself. Ben, calm yourself. It'll all work out. He was in his 80s by the time I met him in 1967. He worked for me to the day he died, almost to the day he died. He got sickly towards the end in 1970. And during that whole time, he never lectured me. He was just there. He'd, he'd been down the road ahead of me. I was telling a coaching client the other day. He said, well, a coaching prospect. Now he's a client. He said, well, what's in it for me? And I said, well, what I can do is cut. I'm 75 years old and you're 20. So I can cut or whatever he was. I can cut 55 years out of your learning curve if you'll listen. I've been down the road. This isn't a mystery to me. You know, I, I've driven Route 66 from Chicago all the way to Pacific Ocean. I know what's there. Now, if you want to drive down it, try and figure it out by yourself, fine. Uh, but I've been there. I've done it right. I've done it wrong. I've gone broke. I've been rich. I've made millions of dollars in a day. Uh, I've lost millions of dollars in a day. And I learned. I kept notes the whole time. So that's what Dr. Hill did for me. He uh, he gave me the benefit of not having to, at 25 or 6, whatever I was at the time, 25, uh, he gave me the benefit of not having to live 80 years to pick up some of his 80-year-old lessons. And he was free to share them with me. Uh, he felt free to share them with me. Uh, he didn't judge me. Uh, he giggled a few times. He used to have sort of a little cackle that he did. Uh, I, knew, I knew when I was really off track, if he cackled at me, 
And, uh, but he let me sort of get behind, I call it the magic table. He let me get behind the magic table, small world department. Bill Dempsey handed me that book on September 15th, 1965. Two years later, Dr. Hill was working for me. He said, well, did it help you? I said, well, it must. You're working for me. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it came from somewhere. Uh, must have been you. And uh, so anyway, the, the, the benefit of that and then the small worldness. Uh, when I left Holiday Magic in 1972, I bought a, uh, a company. Uh, called the Personnel Institute, founded in 1939 by a guy that by the time I knew him was a little past his prime. His name was Morris Pickus. And uh, he said to me one day casually, he knew Dr. Hill had worked for me up until he died. And he said, uh, he said, I knew uh, Dr. Hill. In fact, the reason you, you know Dr. Hill is because I saved his fill in the blank career, we'll call it. And I said, well, how'd you do that? And he said, well, I gave W. Clement Stone, he called him Clem, which I came to do in time. I gave W. Clement Stone his first copy of Think and Grow Rich as a hello gift. He was there to sell Clem Stone something else, but he gave it as a gift like people used to do back when they had manners. You know, uh, hi, I'm, I'm visiting. Here's something I thought you'd like. And he gave him a copy of Think and Grow Rich. It had had a little sales bump in its beginning, but it, the book and Dr. Hill were, Hill were fading into obscurity. Clem Stone read the book, loved what he read, insisted that all of his agents at Combined Insurance buy it and read it, or maybe he gave it to him as gifts in some cases, and uh, so on. So the circle, you know, I'm handed the book, the guy works for me. I meet a guy who says he gave Clem Stone the book. So I had met Stone several times. He spoke at a couple of our seminars. He didn't, he didn't work for me, but he spoke, we, we paid him to speak at some seminars. And uh, I call, I had his number, so I called him and I said, uh, Clem, I, I got a guy here who claims he's the reason you jacked up Think and Go Rich and turned it into the bestseller of all time in that division. And uh, he said, oh, is Morris there with you? And it turned out it was Morris Pickus. And he even told me, I've got it in my notes somewhere, one of Clem Stone's books, there's a paragraph about the day Morris Pickus handed him that book. So I get an old beat up copy. Then the guy comes to work for me. Then I buy a company that was headed by the guy who had gave Clem Stone his book and it, it circle all, you know, it's incredible. I just answered a want ad in the Atlanta journal constitution. I wasn't trying to create, the self-improvement industry, which we did in another set of seminar companies, uh, the modern version. I wasn't there to become a multimillionaire. I was just trying to put my wife through nursing school on $100 a week. And the Napoleon Hills of the world, and there were several of Merle Nightingale and others, uh, were they saved me. If only by accident, they saved me. Okay. Um, let's round up now with um, the the word the closer, closing the sale. Now you say in, in your books that you you know from the moment you step outside of your front door, uh, out into the public domain, you're closing all the time. How you appear, how you walk, how you are dressed, how you open your car door, how you sit down, how you walk into a meeting room and how you speak to people whether you're on the phone or otherwise that you're constantly closing all the time can you explain that term to the audience please yeah i put it in show business terms when i walk out the front door it's one of the reasons i don't like local clients i don't want to be on stage all the time but i almost can't help it it's the way i've trained myself I'm, my life is on script uh, but I, I liken it to show business when you step out the door it's sort of ta-da here he is uh, he's on, he's now working. And I, and I used it as recently as last night. We walked into a crowded restaurant that we go to frequently, but we're not, uh, I'm not throwing hundred dollar bills around. We're just polite and nice to people and praise good help and tell the management about it and so on. So I do all those things you're supposed to do if you're a good salesman trying to get good service. But we walk into a crowded restaurant where there's a, a line, not a long line, but eight or 10 people were there before us and we didn't have reservations. I took my chances. I don't usually do that. And I walked in and a lady who was waiting tables the last time we were there 
now is the last night was the hostess and she said mr gay how are you it's so good to see you and hug me she i uh, said uh you you got a table uh, that, how, how long would it be i don't like to wait she said, of course we have a table and she led us right through to a table it was just finished off being cleaned it was a booth the only booth the only table in the restaurant that was available and we went right to it and then uh, a, a nice young man came up and he said my name is so and so and i'll be your waiter tonight i said my name is ben i'll be your customer tonight we <laughs> laughed and and he, he said i just he said you and your wife who i also introduced he said you and your wife your smiles just just get me you're infectious i had heard that i was lucky to get your table tonight and he gave us impeccable service i mean everything was right there when it was supposed to be and so on and he, he wasn't annoying but he checked with us if only by walking by slowly and glancing in other words hello i'm available and so on. And GD said, she said this before, she's not stupid, but she smiled and she said, we're so lucky we always get good service. I said, luck has nothing to do with it. It's how we treat people. I'm always on. Uh, I'm very nervous before, I, nervous isn't the right word, anxious. I'm anxious before I go down from the suite we're usually in and whatever hotel we're in, before I go down and walk into a room of you know, 500 or 5,000 strangers and so on. And you don't necessarily know anybody when you first hit the door. Uh, but uh, as, as I'm fiddling around and delaying as long as I can, I, I, I want to be there when they open, but I don't want to be there 15 minutes before they open. So I'm delaying and so on. And then uh, GT finally says, you put it off as long as you can. Let's go. I straighten my shoulders and I say, Mr. Gay is ready to go to work. And we walk out and down the hallway as if everyone in the world were watching us, even though we're usually us and the cleaning lady are the only ones in the hall. But you never know. Uh, we walk down the hall. We stride into the room. I make eye contact with somebody. And I go, hi, I'm Ben Gay. I'm speaking here today. Uh, can you introduce me to some people? And so I'm boom, boom, boom. We're gone. And rather quickly, Gigi's very good at this. Everybody loves it. We're separated. Now two of us are working the room and we have infiltrated another group. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the key to it. I am, I, I don't mean it in an insincere way because it has become me or Nightingale said, if you do something for 30 days, you can, in 30 days, you can break any habit or create any new habit. Well, I've been trying to be the, the person who treats you as if you're the only person in the world for 52 years now. I've just about got it down. And uh, so I sometimes I have to go be Ben Gay, just like Roy Rogers, Dolly Parton, and Cher. So it's always closing. I mean, I mean the, the typical thing on um, the infiltration, I mean, in all fairness, um, just to make it clear, um, in most cases, when you are infiltrating um, a sale or anything of that sort of nature, you do it as natural as possible. It's not something that I, I sort of planned out that I, I will do this to get Ben to talk to me. I think it was just a natural sort of reoccurrence. And one thing led to the next and so on. And the same thing with your sales. If you're sort of like planning it as a strategy that you're going to do it all the time without sincerity, it can backfire very easily on you. So, you know, if you make it as part of your life, uh, as natural as possible, I think you're likely to succeed more than what you would trying to uh, uh, fake it. Yeah, but you're the one who said insincerity, not me. I am absolutely sincere. It's just that when I meet somebody in this situation, I say pretty much the same thing. Now, some of them are fill in the blanks. My, what a beautiful hair uh, hairstyle you have, or what a lovely blouse that would look great on Gigi, or you know what, a, fill in the blank, fill in the blank, fill in the blank. But the routine is the same. I would also volunteer this information. Always remember what you're selling at that time. When I first meet somebody, let's say I'm selling lawnmowers, which I did when I was at Macy's years ago. I'm selling lawnmowers. It's not high. You want the red one or the green one? I infiltrate and I become their friend, et cetera, because at that point, I'm not selling lawnmowers. I'm selling Ben Gay and a relationship. 
And then at the next point, I'm selling, do you mind if I question you? If I ask you questions, I'll be straight with you. You'd be straight with me. And the next point, let me give you a great example. Years ago, a friend of mine called me. He wasn't a friend when he called, but now a good friend of mine called from Hawaii. He had several hundreds of acres of one acre lots in Arizona. And he wanted to know if I could help him sell them. I said, sure. He said, well, I'll send you the one ad we're running now. And then you change it any way you want. And then we'll, that'll, that'll be great. And I said, what, what do you want me to do with the one ad? And he said, I want you to sell the property. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> That's not what we're selling in a one inch one ad to somebody who's never heard of us, may not know where Arizona is on a map, and certainly never heard of your development or your little town. <laughs> That's not what we're selling. We have to keep straight what we're selling. And he said, well, what are we selling? I said, at that point, we're going to sell them on dialing a toll-free number to hear a recorded message. You're not going to dial in and get jumped on by some salesperson. So that's all we're selling. I'm trying to get them to pick up the phone or get it out of their pocket or whatever they do nowadays. Uh, I want them to pick up the phone and dial 800, whatever the number was, and that's it. If they do that, I have made a sale. Boom. He said, then what? I said, then they're going to hear a recorded message by somebody. I'll write the script. Well, it turned out I wound up doing it, but not as Ben Gay. I was just a voice. Uh, I, I then give them the information they need per our earlier question about how long is the script going to be. I gave them numerous points to bail out along the way. If you're ready, just hit the pound sign, wait for the beep, and leave your name and mail-in address and email and so on. Because at that point, we are selling only, I want your name and the way to contact you. That's all we're selling. And uh, he said, well, when do we sell the property? <laughs> I said, well, when, when they get the sales package, we send it physically and they now can get it online. But when we send the sales package in there, they're going to pick up, open it up, and they're going to pick up a sales letter. And then, and when all the brochures and how beautiful the land is and so on. And then, and only then, are we going to ask them to buy property, to buy one acres that they've never seen, that they typically in that type of development may never see. Maybe their grandchildren will see it at some point down the line uh, and so on that's the only time we're going to do that. And he said, well, uh, that seems like that would take a long time. And I said, how long, how many have you sold? And I'm making up numbers. I don't remember it, but I, how many lots have you sold in the past year? Uh, 30. And I said, what if we could sell that many in a day after the packages showed up? He said, oh, that's not possible. Well, we sold 600 lots. He had to buy more land. We sold 600 lots to people who'd never seen the property, I repeat, may never see the property, sold to them by me, who's never seen the property. I mean, I've seen pictures of it. Never seen, and my, my father opened up Apple Valley, so I know what desert looks like. I don't have to fly to Arizona to see sand. I got it. Uh, so, and we're selling it based on the value of, we all know what it is. We're not claiming this is Beverly Hills. We're not claiming rolling lawns. We're just claiming that there's already three or 400 homes built there, that there's a golf course in, and that when and if you want to retire, you can, and maybe sell it for a profit or give it to your grandkids. Upfront, straight, honest, uh, treating them fairly, squarely, decently by the rules, 600 lots. Uh, because I kept in mind what I was selling. I'm selling you to call to call me. I'm selling you to give me your phone number, your mailing address. I'm selling you to read the package. And in that package, I'm selling you to call back and give us your credit card and buy or send a check. It had a return envelope in it. Okay. Um, so huge I, factor in selling is never forget where you are in the sales process and what you're selling. It's rarely, in, you know, if there's 10 steps, the 10th one is the product. If there's five steps, the fifth one is the product. Okay. Finally, when um, two people are together, um, they've done the presentation, they've gone through the formalities and the last few words to get the order from the client. 
what should the last few words be um, in, in that? So the hesitation isn't there, or, or I go to consult my co-director or my wife or somebody as such. What What is the most sort of powerfulest last uh, few words or last few sentences that one could end up with to make sure they got a higher percentage of closure? With my, closing, my closing rate is about 86%. I don't keep track of it every single day, but when I go back and check it, it's been hovering around 86% for years. I'm not talking about you call up and order a book. That's not a sale. That's just clerical work. I'm talking about a sale, coaching, consulting, giving a seminar, you know, whatever, or selling a big product for some other client, uh, 86%. And in all of them, I use what I call the magic close. First of all, I have become a sales infiltrator, as explained in the last chapter of the closers part two. So I'm already in, this is not, this is an answer to your question, though it doesn't sound like it. In other words, I've done the setup work. Always remember what you're selling. When I'm talking to somebody, I'm always trying to get into a position where I can use the magic clothes on them and expect and, and, and deserve a positive response. I don't ask people to buy. When you go to law school, I'm told, we have a son that just graduated recently. They'd say, never ask a question to which you don't already know the answer. So when I ask you to buy, and I'll tell you how in just a second, when I ask you to buy, I already know the answer. If it's on the phone, I'm already writing the order. I usually, if I'm sitting at my other desk, I'm, I'm writing, you know, so, I'm, so tell me, what do you think, blah, blah, blah. It's already written up because I, I, I know I start writing when I hear that you've fallen over the edge. You're on my side now. So I, I spent all that time getting in a position to say, and this can vary a little bit here and there, a word or two, no more than that. Uh, well, Mo, based on what you've told me, Here's what I suggest we do. Remember, I'm on your team now. Team A and B have dissolved. There's now <laughs> team C, and we're both on the same team. So, Mo, based on what you've told me, here's what I suggest we do. Fill in the blank. Blah, 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 blah. Fair enough. And at that point, 86% of the people I talk to say yes, because I got in position to be justified to ask the question. Uh, I've, I've been fair, square, decent with them all the way. I've been straight, straight with them. Uh, I've answered all the tough questions. And when I thought they were getting close to a question and they lost their nerve to ask it, I said, I, I think I thought you were about to ask me so-and-so. I bring it up. You have a built-in objection to bring it up first and brag about it. I bring it up first. so that. I can say, based on what we've discussed, or based on, and that's the only variation, based on what we've discussed, or based on what you've told me, here's what I suggest we do, fill in the blank, pause, fair enough. And it's, if you've gotten yourself positioned, it's very, it's also hard enough, it's hard to say, I didn't create the term fair enough, but I brought it to selling as a close, as the last two words in a, in a close. And now, I'm, I, I hope it's not one of those things that gets so popular it becomes worn out. I, I was at a fast food thing the other day, and she said, do you want uh, the large or the small come with a deal? Uh, with the larger deal, you get so-and-so. Fair enough. And I said, you can't use that in a fast food <laughs> place. That's my close. But we do it to sell corporate jets, not hamburgers. <laughs> but, you know, it, but it's it's like uh, Larry Wilson came up with the term years ago, feel, felt, found. I know how you feel. Others found the same thing. Or others felt the same way. Here's what they found. Well, it was such a magic phrase that it became so popular. You could say it to a potential buyer and you say, I know how you feel. And say, well, tell me uh, how others have felt. And then tell me what they found. They got ahead of us. So we had to keep quit using it. Although I saw it on television just the other day in a reverse mortgage commercial. Uh, another way for the banks to steal your house. Well, uh, I felt the same way, but here's what I found. I said, oh, it's finally made a comeback. Fair enough is one of those. So far, it hasn't worn itself out, but it is magic. If you did the heavy lifting up front, if you start out with it, it means nothing. 
Ben, I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the valuable time and the knowledge that you've just shared with everybody, including myself, because I'm always constantly learning from you, from your books and yourself personally. And it's a journey that never stops in our learning. We learn continuously throughout the whole of our life, regardless how old we are. And, and, and I believe it's just a quest for knowledge and to become better every day so than the day before. So I really, really appreciate the time and the value that you've actually given here to the uh, members. And also the people that are going to be um, listening to this video after um, you know, the recording goes back up onto YouTube itself, and I'm sure there'll be many more that will benefit from this. And, you know, God willing, a bit further down the line, again, maybe a few months, if you have the time, we could probably carry on the conversation a little bit more deeper uh, based on the sort of questions and um, concerns that the people actually voice over the coming weeks or coming months, if that works uh, uh, for you. I would love to do it. And let me, uh, not to be a cheap book peddler, but let me tell your people where to go to get the books at the lowest price, lower Please. than I will sell it to them. Uh, and they will get more from these conversations if they've read the books than if they haven't read the books. One of my coaching Absolutely. requirements is, do you have my coach to a coaching client? Do you have my books? No. Well, get the books, read them, and then call me back. We'll discuss a coaching re relationship. There's no point in me spending their valuable time and money going through a book they could have read virtually for free. So you can get, the uh, listeners can get, the closers, that's part two, but the closers part two, the closers part one, and sales closing power, the book I did for the great sales trainer, J. Douglas Edwards, all at an eBay site at a discount. The eBay site is stores, S-T-O-R-E-S dot eBay dot com slash Ronzoni books. That's spelled R-O-N-Z-O-N-E books, all one word, Ronzoni books. Go there. There's other stuff there, but scan down and find that three book set on special. And if you do nothing else, for your, if people say, you know, Mr. Gay, I'd, I'd give anything to know what you know about selling. Well, it's available for, I think it's $65.95 on eBay. And so if you want to know what I know about selling, there's nothing stopping you now. Uh, go learn it. Well, I can hand on heart say that I made a foolish mistake. And where, where's my proof? Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> a copy of the close, <laughs> which Dan urged <laughs> me about nine years ago. And then, Ended up getting the wrong closer until uh, earlier. Yeah, make sure, make sure what you get has an S on the end. The closers <laughs> of novel. Absolutely. Um, Dan, Dan Kenny's been endorsing me for about forty years, and I've been endorsing him for about the same length of time. And I'm going to have to get him a memo that says, "Put an S <laughs> on the end of it." <laughs> now, it's uh, the first book is is hard to digest. It is hardcore and it's very very powerful. But you need to read the first book before you go to the second one. The second one, I think, is far more applicable. But without understanding the first one, you're going to find you not, might not get as much value out of the second one. So it's not a way of trying to get you to buy both of the books. It's a way of getting you to become a better sales closer at the end of the day by having both of them. Well, they should all three be bound together as one book. But uh, I wasn't that smart when we did the first one. Or the second, or the third. You got to sort of wait. Um, the, the URL for the eBay, I will put that on tomorrow on the bottom of the video on um, on YouTube. Um, um, ben, if you could put that eBay uh, one in the business mastery group as well as on my timeline, that way they can they can have access to it immediately um, for the shop. If anybody hasn't got the book yet, and those that want to uh, reach out and get the book, um, you can also get the audio versions that are a little bit more, but I personally like the audios. The audios are far more powerful because, you know, most people aren't going to get a chance to read the book all the way through. Whereas, you know, we all drive in cars, we've all got MP3s on our phones and you're likely to get through that and learn more. And you can even, what I tend to do every few months is just plug it in at the faster speed and it will still get through in about half the time and you'll still absorb you know, certain bits that were relevant to you. So you know, there's plenty of benefits there to be had from the audio version or, or the written version, whichever is your um, choice of preference. Is there anything else that you would like to add, Ben? 
No, if they have any money lying around, they don't know what to do with, just mail it to me, uh, Ben Gay, Placerville, California, and the postmaster will get it to me. <laughs> I'll make sure I'll intercept um, those for the homeless people, those envelopes. <laughs> no, I appreciate it, Mo. Thank you very much. Thank I heard you, some man. familiar you, names. I really appreciate it, Tom heard some familiar names in those questions, the people asking the questions. So I really appreciate that. Guys, thank you again for being on there. George, I'm sorry, George is just uh, bounced the question really, really, really. Thank you, my friend. Of course, I think, oh no, that's right. It's just, um, the guys are just uh, thanking us for um, the, the, the value that we've created for them and the knowledge that they've gained. So Ben, I will say farewell, my friend, and we'll speak shortly. All right. Thank Have you. a great day, Mo. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you.